Good morning. Welcome to the OK Grognard Show. It is Thursday, May 14th, 2020, 9.30 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. This is uh, a new segment for us, a new uh, Thursday plan, this miniatures painting and terrain building uh, Thursday, I guess. I don't know. What are we calling it? Anyway, I tried to pick something simple. Um, I picked up some of these miniatures, uh, these WizKids from Wave 9, 737, 3, 1, Deep Cuts, Unpainted Miniatures, this Catapult. And as you can see from the uh, title board, there are available pictures online of the size of these babies. They're uh, they're not as small as you might expect from from just glancing at it here because you know when I saw the picture I thought well it's going to be this little little two inch thing and it's going to look small next to a crew of three four five whatever men-at-arms that you have to assign to it if you're wargaming. And then I thought, oh, you know, well, I'll get one. So I got one. And then once I saw it, I thought, oh, no, well, no, I, I need to get a... I need to get a handful of these because they're actually pretty good-looking. And uh, they are a good size for what they are. Let's switch over to the workbench camera have a look there's one in the packaging I will be on the uh, other side of the room so I will not be readily available to the chat I'll keep an eye on it from a distance if anybody shows up I'll take a minute and step on over and give it a quick uh, hello or whatever but I want to look at this a little more closely. So let's have a peek here. There we go. Whiz Kids, Deep Cuts, Catapult. I mean, here it is in my hand, right? Doesn't look small. Uh, like I said, I picked up a number of them. So here's one out of the packaging. Now you can see that there are pretty serious mold lines along the, or mold line along the top of that and along the back. Now both of them underneath. So we're going to take a minute and just clean up some of that. Uh, set that out to the side there. So you could take a file and run it across this, but I think you'd be in danger of just flattening out what little wood grain you have along this. It doesn't have to be perfect because a mold line is to some extent going to look like a bit of the wood grain at some point, right? But it doesn't hurt to uh, you know, some people say you should wear some gloves while doing this sort of thing. Some of those don't cut your hands gloves, and uh, I don't disagree. I don't have a pair, but it's not a bad idea if you're not using them you definitely want to cut away unless you have something to dig into so for instance I can come toward me as long as I'm going into that and not going into my thumb right this is not the sharpest of exacto knife blades right now probably could use a changeover but 
Notice how in this case, the actual blade is pointed away from me. I'm going against it and just kind of scrape along the top. That's fairly safe, I guess. And if I'm doing it this way and my thumb isn't bracing the board at the bottom, right? And I say the board, I mean the beam of the timber, the lumber. Is it's timber, right? It's not finished, so it's not lumber yet. It's been cut, but it hasn't been finished. Does that make it? Does that make it uh, lumber or timber rather than lumber? Is that actually a distinction, or is that just in my head? Let's see. Hmm. I don't know. I can kind of see. That's not bad. Anyway, like I said, the line actually looks like it can blend in to some degree with the actual actual wood. Let's just say wood. Let's not have that little timber lumber argument for 20 years. Notice this is a, a bowl cut out of wood as opposed to a big metal bowl or a or a uh, just a sack or some sort of open sling on a fork which uh, you might just expect in some cases well this kind of brush this stuff off to the side for a second Clean it up later with a vacuum so that we get up every little bit of it. Anyway, let's put this away. Um, gears. Interesting. We've got rope. Rope. Hmm. Got a little bit of a mold line along the edge of that, too, though, huh? That's a little tricky because it goes against. suppose if we scrape across it, the rope's just going to look more worn. It'll be a little flattened in some area, though. I don't know if I care for that. But they got to put the mold somewhere, right? It's got to... you got to fill it in. You can see... It's not too bad. Does it go all the way down along the edge of that? I guess it does. But it's really not that noticeable. Okay. That's a little better. What about along these? Those look okay. Alright. Along the edge of that. How does this fit into the mold? These two cranks. So part of what we got to decide, <clears throat> and if you look at the painted version, which I think is probably the same picture as what we had on that title page, it's just all dark. We'll just paint it all brown. That'll look fine. And you know what? For 90% of the jobs that are getting done on these, there's no doubt. And probably mine will end up. Hey, by the way, one little scaven. Let's have a look at that next to next to the uh, thing. What about this guy? Here's a old school mini, so he's a true 25, right? We put him standing next to Standing next to this, so if we're going to use this in a chainmail game with a 
25 millimeter guy. It's kind of a good view there, right? Then the, uh, the size we're talking about for these is uh, pretty big. This is pretty good, actually. No complaints. Anyway, we got the gears. Those are going to be metal. I was talking about the fact that we got wood and rope. But we got metal there. Now, these pegs, are we going to say those are metal or are they wood? We know that's wood. There's a gear. You kind of see gear inside where the, uh, the shaft goes through the larger timber. These are studded. So there's an iron band probably around the outside of that tire. Right? And studs on it. This is so it doesn't get stuck in the mud. We've got some heavy-duty nails there, right? And there. So those are ends. Now those can be black. I see a few along the inside there. And along the inside there. It'd be easier if I'm pointing with the tip of the exacto knife. Maybe. See? One, two, three, four. All right? All these gears. The gear in the inside. I don't know how easy that is to see. You can kind of see it from here, I think. All right? The gear on the inside. Let's put my hand behind it. You're on the inside by the shaft. But are these uh, pegs? Just wooden pegs? They could snap off, so maybe they should be painted as if they're metal. The rope, we want that to look different from the wood. Well, I'll tell you, when I spin this around... Hmm, I guess it's all right. It's not bad. Um, that's about it. That's about it. That's about it for the metal versus wood. So now that we got it, now we've cleaned it up a little bit, we've got to have a look here. You know, I picked up some new brushes, some Army Painter brushes. War game small dry brush, regiment brush, insane detail brush. But you know what? These are these are too good for this project. This this project does not except maybe the rivets and some of the some of the gearing. This is not gonna require a lot of finer detail. Well I need to break out the old I don't think so. That can set off to the side. So let's have a look. I'm not even going to wet palette this one. I'm just going to use the old... Use the old... Uh, <coughs> porcelain palette. Which... Uh, was a nickname... For my... No, we're not even going to say that. Not on air, right? <laughs> Just got a little cup. Old school. Old school with the old porcelain. Ah, uh, what do we got? We got an S-ton of brushes in here. We got our files in here. Can we see all this? Yeah. That's pretty good. We put these files off to the side. We got a little sculpting tool. Forceps, those are handy for things. There's some extra blades. I'm not going to change any blades right now, though. Another sculpting tool. Giant tweezers. All very handy and useful, but we're just in need of brushes right now. Do we have more brushes in here? No, I guess, I guess that's it. All right. This is kind of a to-go bag, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. When I got my new paint set, which I picked up not that long back, I uh, grabbed I 
put a lot of my brushes in this case. An older case I had. Character brush. I've got some of the finer ones. I've got some of the newer D&D &D ones. I've got plenty of brushes, is what I'm saying. But I'm, not, I'm not probably just going to... I don't know. He's, he's, just keep old ones around for dry brushing different size things and for slathering on PVA glue, right? And if you need to uh, mix up some white glue to put some flocking on a base, it's good to keep that ready. Keep a brush handy for using that. All right. We need something big. This is uh, a large dry brush. We just need a good size. I think for this one, I don't want to use the stippling brush. That's the bigger dry brush. Now, these are pre-primed. I did have some idea that I might uh, that I might there we go monster brush there we go can probably use that um, I did some have some idea that I might uh, keep this large dry brush around. I don't want to use the character brush. I keep almost saying something, right? I did have some idea that I might double prime this, that I might prime it again using a brown primer just to cover everything. And then I thought, eh, I want to see, because I have not painted one of these pre-primed figures yet, and I kind of want to see what's going to happen with the uh, kind of want to see what's going to happen with the paint sticking to this or not uh, I thought about because I saw that uh, Game of Thrones Wapple video and uh, he did that liner Free liner. Hmm. Black. I think what I want to do. So we've got. Do we want to go this route? Soft tone, flesh wash, strong tone dark tone. I guess, well, we don't want to use a flush wash. And if we're going to do this, I think we'd want to go with the dark tone to get into the grains. Right? Yeah, let's just put this down. We want to be able to get into the grains, and we got to look at after we do that what's going on on top. Hmm. Always with the browns. I also thought about just using some. It was an oak brown. brown is not what we want. This monster brown might be good for some highlighting. Maybe it's not light enough. Desert yellow, fur brown. Let's save those. I think I might wind up using monster brown. I thought about just using some cheapo paints. The old uh, apple crate, apple barrel, whatever they call them. From uh, 
from the hobby stores, or the craft stores. They're inexpensive. I'm going to be painting multiples of these. And part of the thinking is that as I go through these, am I going to want to be using a lot of my regular paint on them? And then I decided maybe, maybe not. Maybe I should actually be painting two of these. Got a couple of saddle brown, model colors, leather brown. I'm looking at some stuff in the other room. So I'm away from the camera. I can't show you this stuff. Flat brown. I'll bring in tan earth. I got a ton of browns from another mahogany brown. Mm. I don't know if I want a reddish hue. I'm going to say no. Mm. Nope, nope, nope. Those don't work. That's about it for the browns, I guess, huh? These are uh, Vallejo colors that I'm looking at in the other room, and then I've also got some leftover at a color A D I K O L O R from another thing, but I'm not sure what kind of shape those are in, so I'm going to walk away from those. Let me bring these with me. just to give some selection to this. Let's have a quick look at the uh, chat area. Nope, we're all good. Nobody's in there just yet. So we're recording. This is going to be a rather long... So I've got some Reapers. And I've got some Vallejo, in this case a flat brown. know if this is any good anymore. This actually might not be worth using. I don't know. Maybe we'll check it out. So what I was talking about was the idea that I could possibly just use some of these Craft Smart. You know, they got Apple Barrel or Apple Crate or whatever they call those other ones, but, you know, you've just got a basic brown, you've got a basic golden brown, you got a basic tan, so you got a bit of a range of shades that you can use this for. Use these, um, if you're using these, you've got a range that you can use for highlighting and for base coating, right? Base coat with this. Um, it's pretty thin. It takes multiple coats generally with this. What this tends to be good for is uh, when you've got a lot of area to cover. So if you're doing um, terrain, um, another trick I used to do back in the day when I painted a lot more terrain was I would uh, use an acrylic paint or a uh, latex paint. I would go buy I would go over to a uh, to a hardware store or a paint store. I would ask them if they had any mist tints. I used to work in a paint store so I'd learned about this when I worked there that occasionally they would be trying to match a color and they'd go too dark or they'd screw it up somehow and then they'd have this uh, can that they'd set off to the side they'd discount it and sell it to whoever was willing to take it as is at whatever color it was sometimes they were decent colors sometimes 
They were oddball colors because you were trying to match something weird. And if you were off, it would not work. But you were stuck with a bad can of, you know, sometimes it'd be a quart. Sometimes it'd be, uh, you know, a little touch-up uh, little touch-up can. Sometimes it'd be a whole gallon. <clears throat> but what we would do, back when I used to do theater, we'd do this too. We'd swing by. We'd just get whatever we can. We'd mix it up and use it for different sets. It'd be cheaper that way. You could get a gallon for five bucks often. Um, but for terrain painting, because you're working often with foam, which uh, primers would eat through, if you covered them with just latex paint, and you'd have to paint both sides, you don't want it drying and curling up on you, but you could just give it a good strong coat of uh, latex paint on both sides, top and bottom, and uh, boy, that worked out really well. You'd use some, you'd get cheap paint, you'd get good coverage, you'd wind up with, uh, and then, you know, with latex paint, because of its uh, consistency, if you wanted to put the flocking, if you're looking to get some texture, into it, you can drop flocking or grit or whatever directly into latex paint before it dries. You know, it depends whether you want it to sink in or if you want it kind of scattered on top. And uh, it'll hold right in there. It does a pretty good job in that regard. The um, So, we got to decide. I've got, I don't know, eight, nine of these things. And uh, I have to figure out whether I want to paint it cheap or use better paints. Well, I've got some Grimtooth dice. One, six, with the old skulls. Pretty nifty. I like these. Dead. So, odds, we go with the cheap paint. Evens, we go with the uh, better paints. Now, there's a rule that if you randomize something, you don't have to stick with the result. Sure, it seems like you have to. Why randomize it otherwise? Well, if you're not sure what you want to do, say, so you know what? Odds I do this, evens I do that and you roll the other from what you really want but you just couldn't push yourself to make up your mind well you may find that the die roll just drives you in the other direction well we rolled odds I'm not unhappy with that I'm okay using the cheapo paint on this one see how it turns out And I like the idea that uh, since we have nine of them, I like the idea that we won't be using jars and jars and jars of my army paint, army painter paint. We'll go ahead and drop a good bunch in there. Will we go through it all? Meh, I don't know. We're going to put it on everything. We're going to paint the uh, metal bits later on top. Hey, by the way, I just noticed something, and I want to point it out real quick. They've got these, you know those pins you put in to the shaft behind the wheel to hold the wheel in place? Those are metal. So 
So we got to remember those are there. And look, one, two, three, four rivets there, four rivets there. What is this? Is this? Hmm. I think that's a mold. I think that's a mold thing. Yeah. Maybe that's where they inject the entire mold. Okay. Glad I saw it. All right. Here we go. Get a little water on there. We got to get plenty of paint on there. We don't care. Hmm. We actually don't want much water on this. Like I said, this is really thin paint. This is going to take multiple layers. So we can just slather it on. We opted against doing the liner first, and that's okay. I would rather just cover, cover, cover. We'll see how it looks when we're done. Not going to put it on thick. We're not looking to lose any of the detail that's in this there's not a there's there's a fair amount of detail I guess you know it's a it's a pre-painted plastic plastic or a pre-primed plastic mini so with pre-painted plastics from the 90s and 2000s you didn't see a ton of detail the old uh, Mage Knight figures the uh, DDM, Dungeons and Dragon miniatures game miniatures that everybody used for all sorts of Dungeons and Dragons games besides the minis game, which was fun too, kind of a streamlined D and D. We'll just throw a little on there. No. I don't know if it matters if it's on the hub of the tire, or rather the uh, outer end of the tire, but we're going to cover it anyway. We'll just get it all on there. We can paint over it with the metal later. That's what we're going to do. In fact, we're going to get a second coat of this on here before we go anywhere near the metal paint. That we're going to wind up using, and we haven't chosen what we're going to use for that yet either. But it's no rush. We can give us some thought. We just want to make sure this first coat gets on everywhere. It doesn't have to be pretty. We don't want it pooling up, so be careful about that. If you see areas where it looks like it's pooling up a little bit, just drag your brush across it, thin it out. If you see areas where it looks like it could use more coverage, well, maybe give it a little quick, quick swipe. But honestly, you'll you'll get that you'll get that on the next pass. Remember, this is cheap paint. You're not gonna. You know, it's 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 not thick model paint. And a lot of model paints aren't that thick to begin with, right? Here, let's just splash that in there. A lot of model paints are that aren't that thick either. They're honestly uh most of them are because a lot of people prefer to thin down their paints and do multiple coats, especially the people that paint really well, i.e. not the crowd I run with, <laughs> paint-wise. Um, so they, they tend to, uh, paints tend to be thinner these days. The old Vallejos were pretty thick. Um... Newer stuff, you know, I haven't actually bought new Vallejo paints in a while. So I don't know if they've changed their consistency or formula at all. Um, which 
which is fine. Maybe someday when I'm uh, at the store, I'll just get a bottle. Next time I'm at a store that carries Vallejo, I'll get a bottle of Vallejo Black just to uh, just to test, just to see whether it is the same thicker paints that it used to be or if they've thinned it down. Who knows, maybe somebody watching this will chime in and say, hey, I use Vallejo these days and it's just like you were saying or it's very different from what it used to be or they'll give me a heads up on the idea where we at here do 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 underneath back behind there we go like I said try not to let it pool up all you're gonna do is get what looks like a lumpy paint job but in the same token try to get good coverage you wanna it's been pre-primed so it's not like you're gonna have holes in your paint job like you would if you didn't prime it well but what you will have is a potential need to do a third coat fourth coat whatever or come back and touch it up after you've and what you're looking to do here is to get one nice coat on there come back get a second coat on there that hides any crappy jobs and portions that you did and then also uh, gives a better coverage follow the grain with the brush after you get it on there as much as you can That'll help keep things looking pretty nice. You don't want your brush strokes to go against the wood grain. That just doesn't look too good. It'll look better if it's with the grain. Like I said, you're coming back in. You're painting second, third, possibly coat. So don't spend too much time at it. Get it on there. Move on. Here we go. Obviously, uh, with the tan, when we come back in and do the ropes, we'll do a sort of a tan with those. And that'll look, look good, but it doesn't hurt to slather this on now for the time being. And uh, just to get a get something down, which you come in with the second time around, we'll uh, tighten everything up for you. Okay, that's all rope. That's all rope. That's okay. What we got here? Let's go up and down these boards here. Are we hurting the brush? Slapping it around like that? Well, I'll tell you, I have always described my style of painting as slapping on some paint. And if you ever heard me say that now, you know exactly why that is. We can reshape brushes to a certain extent if we don't nail them too hard, but sooner or later brushes wear out. And brushes that are severely worn can be used for less delicate work. I like what I'm doing now. I probably should have used a crappier brush for this first coat, but that's okay. I don't want to be uh, cavalier about it, but I can get more brushes if I need them. And uh, 
honestly getting this first one this first coat on here with a decent brush is a little easier than throwing it on with a crappy brush Oop, let's do that we'll throw that back on there I don't know if we ever really got that on there get underneath there we go a little more on there. Get the pegs. Let's see, we got the underside of that. Can't quite see that. That's part of a part of the charm of the angle I have versus the angle you have. If I switch some of this to the angle you need to see, then I can't necessarily get in there or see it myself. So sometimes I'm just sticking my brush in a place where you can't see me sticking it in. No, don't. Don't make that into an innuendo, please. And, uh, oh, there we go. Let's just slap some paint on the backs of those. We'll slather it on there. And the brush across. There we go. And get that down the bottom. We never did get that very well. That's good. That's good. Oops, now I see a little knob sticking up out the. Mm -mm. Where did that go? Oh yeah, it's on the tire. Yep. There we go. Alright. Where are we at? We still got this all in view? I guess we do. Maybe we need to move it up a little higher. Let's have a look over there. All right, and get that again. Get the bottoms of these wheels. Get the timber going across. Just make sure we get a good first coat. We got a little bit on the rope there. Tip this up. Go with the grain on the bucket. Not even the rope there. Okay. So what do we got? I think we got it pretty well covered on the first time for the first coat. And quick, see a little spot where I'm not very well done there. Remember, I'm coming back. Doesn't have to be perfect. Go with the grain. Blah blah blah. That's a little thick on top there. We'll be losing some detail if we let it pool up so don't don't let it pool up as much as you can avoid it okay oh we got that corner on top there those look a little raw and now that we're on the other side these pegs and the top of that wheel look a little less than covered okay all right on the wheel on the rope inside of the rope oh look at that I hope you can see that from the angle I didn't see it until I got that other angle all right you know what we're gonna do we're gonna do that get a little bit a little bit there right on the top across the side there all right now we're not 
not going to give this a full 10 minutes to dry, but we are going to let it go for a little time. Let's clean off the ferrule. Reshape the brush a little bit. We're not using a cleaner just yet, so reshaping only does so much, but it is a monster brush, so can leave it like that. Anyway, I'm going to hop on over to the computer desk and let that just kind of dry for a little bit. Good morning, Lost Nomad. Finished product next week. Will I show you the finished product next week? Indeed, uh, such as it is, I will do just that. Um, finished product is kind of a kind of a uh, weird term. Fubra. Hmm. We've got somebody who created an account three days ago. That's following the stream, it appears. I don't know if that's a new person or somebody else. We'll see. Um, now, what you can see from the video that I can't see with my eyes under the light as it is, is how thin this coverage is on this first pass. It's good that it is because we're avoiding losing any any detail that way but uh, we'll go back in we'll give it a second coat um, as far as the stream is concerned we uh, talked about a few things we got a few things done we got a first coat on and honestly I don't want to rush back to it I think we want to see how this dries naturally and that's going to take more time than we have in what's left of the stream today so I can't even move over to something else and then come back to this because I don't want to go beyond an hour and we're at 47 minutes already so I tell you what we're gonna do we're gonna do a little closing business shut this down for the day I'm gonna mess around with some of this and maybe I'll do an impromptu stream later this afternoon if uh, things are moving along and I have time to do it but in the meantime let's have a quick look at the rest of some future stuff all right I keep threatening to get this discord off of here because uh, the plan is to use just roll 20 with um, the native uh, voice and uh, video chat video won't be required if people want to just just use the voice that's fine too I find games tend to run better if you also had the video going people pay a little closer attention when they're on camera the whole time is part of it um, the rest of it however is that you can see when somebody's anxious to say something. Um, you can uh, you, you interrupt people less often when you can actually see them while you're all in a room together talking. That's why meetings are what meetings are. Um, but voice is the only thing required, and the voice will be inherent uh, native to Roll Twenty, and that's what we'll use. I checked out how these games were set up and. Uh, all, all of them are full. So, Count of Champions, which now has, has had everybody at every level allowed to uh, allowed to register for events. Has gotten um, to the point now where all, all six of the D&D games and the board game are filled up and I think three of the six have a handful of people uh, on the waiting list so I think we're pretty full on the games um, hop on a waiting list if you want um, if you don't mind 
I may contact you from that waiting list for future events that I may be running so that might be a reason to jump on there it may be that uh, that there's a way of uh, making sure you get contacted for other events that aren't already on the schedule if I for instance do an impromptu event in one of these open areas or a late night nine o'clock event on any of the three days of the con one of the things I'll do is I'll try to uh, I'm doing air quotes now harvest people from the waiting lists of games that I've already run so that uh, we can get some more people playing that haven't had a chance to play yet so could be worth jumping on a waiting list just to be in the pool of potential players either for dropouts or for extra games that might get added can't hurt the rest of the uh, week pretty simple I'll be working on some of those um, pages for virtual tabletop adventures um, for some of those events I just described this won't uh, ruin the experience for you or if you see me getting close to uh, saying something that might be considered a spoiler I'll certainly make mention of it if you know I don't want there to be uh, I don't want people to come to the game and say oh he's a solve this on your stream so I'll make mention if there's some spoiler and you want to tune out and avoid any that's certainly your prerogative um, I'm often surprised how many times people will go to a convention and they will play a game a classic adventure that they know inside and out and uh, I suppose that's not too dissimilar from picking up an old video game you played back in the day and playing it again there's some skill to getting through it in an expedient fashion with the least number of uh, least number of moves or you know get through it without uh, having to save get through it without dying whatever so you know maybe true too with uh, old school modules or even new modules with which you might be familiar some of the aspects of them Saturday D&D &D, animated series Episode 8 will be in the offing for our DM running review of a cartoon. That'll be fun. Rules Retrospective on Sunday. We'll be getting back into DM Prater's breakdown of first edition AD&D initiative and combat. We'll be moving into the distant section and talking about how that works. And then... You know, we'll expand a little bit on it and uh, discuss how it works with varying terrains. And um, I'll have to look it up again. But one thing that I found with large planes, um, sweeping planes, large outdoor areas without a lot of um, terrain that break it up, is you have to consider what you can see on a horizon. Because uh, somebody crests a hill off in the distance. And how much further you can see if you're up a hill. These are our things that, uh, you know, well, you can gloss over this stuff when you're running a game. If you know this stuff, you can make games a lot more detailed and interesting and uh, immersive by saying, well, you know, you can see a mile and a quarter right now, given the way the broken terrain is um, to the horizon, but... You know, if you take the half hour to climb up that 100-foot hill just to your east, then you'll be able to see to the south an additional quarter mile to a half mile, depending on what the terrain beyond the horizon right now is. So, you know, knowing details like that or knowing how that works can make things interesting so we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow when we're in the distant section of DM Prada's initiative and and uh, 
combat breakdown for first edition AD and D. That's Sunday. Monday, of course, the weekly news and the giveaway. Um, not a ton of news coming up. I mean, um, maybe we'll do a little product news. There's a few cool things out there, like uh, uh, some things Tim Short's Gothrid, Gothridge Manor has uh, gotten out recently, and uh, and uh, the uh, recent zine, recent zine release. Jonathan Bing, Bingham and uh, also, um, well, there's been a few. Um, we're looking at coming up on uh, Carlos Lysing's next streams. He did this fantastic squaring the circle. That's worth checking out on YouTube. Um, Castle Entertainment. Right, C A S L Entertainment. Look that up on YouTube. Check that out. Um, but you know, Marty Walzer. There, there's all sorts of little things that we can mention in the weekly news that I should probably be doing on the regular. You know, um, can't just flog the same old stuff week after week when it's coming up long off in the distance. Cartography and world building on Tuesday. We've got the Grimwald campaign discussion, which will include uh, all sorts of campaign discussion, but often I'll take a closest look at the Grimwald setting because that's a setting I've been working on since 1974 when I started playing. So when I know the best, and it's a good place for me to draw examples from. Um, then we'll be back here. Crafting and painting. We'll see how far I get this afternoon. Maybe, like I said, I'll do an impromptu stream later on this afternoon that will uh, show off a little more of uh, this for a second coat. Maybe I'll break out the other ones. Maybe I should get them all done. Why not? I don't know. I kind of like to see what one looks like before I decide if that's the way I want to paint the rest of them. Kind of a test paint. And even on something as... Uh, clunky, not so detailed as a, as a siege engine. It's still important to make it look good. These are going to be on a tabletop at some point with uh, in a war game situation probably, right? Um, I don't know how long it'll be in lockdown, but at some point I may set up the war gaming table and put together a couple of chainmail games to, to play out um, in parts on streams. So we'll see about that. Um, but wouldn't it be neat to have some siege machines to do that with? Well, I want to thank everybody for popping in. Lost Nomad, I appreciate it. Speaking up in the chat and uh, on Twitch. If you uh, do swing by the Twitch channel during a live stream, be sure to follow and then speak up in the chat. Because that puts you into a weekly drawing automatically. No purchase necessary. And if you're catching all of this on YouTube, please do subscribe. Give us a thumbs up, a thumbs down if you feel that's necessary. It's all good. I would appreciate any kind of feedback we can get from you. And, uh, you know, the spirit in which it's given, though. You know, this is all a positive hobby effort. And uh, hopefully it's taken that way. Hopefully you're getting some out of this. Hopefully you're enjoying it. I know I am. I want to just say goodbye to everybody for the day. We will catch you tomorrow. Tomorrow and every day, 9.30 a.m. That's the plan anyway. A lot of people wonder why I do this with so few viewers and so little real interest in it. And I've got to say, it's just helping me keep track of the days of the week. <laughs> while we're in stay at home and uh, I'm streamlining it in such a way that even after we get back to work this will be something I can uh, knock out every morning and continue to do it won't interfere with my regular work schedule and I'll be happy to continue doing it a little more easily once I've uh, set it up so take care of yourself 
and we will catch you later on. Oop. Uh,